Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Tara Ahmadinejad, um, and I'm here with the creative team of Disclaimer. Uh, Disclaimer is a pie hole show that we created for the Under the Radar Festival at the Public in January 2021. Uh, I am the writer, co-director of the piece, um, and we're so excited you can be here. We, for this event, we are here. Uh, Shad, um, and the, I'm here with the great. Sorry about that. Um, so we're here to talk to you about exactly how we made disclaimer uh, on Zoom. And um, they have a lot to say about this show, but that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. Um, and we welcome uh, any questions you have along the way. You can just feel free to drop them in the chat bar and we're gonna answer them at the end of the session, um, but you can drop the questions in at any time. Um, so we are, um, uh, you know, the show originally was an in-person show um, and it was lightly participatory. And it's, you know, your run of the mill anti-war with Iran propaganda piece that turns into an Agatha Christie murder mystery. Um, and uh, we decided to do it on Zoom. Um, we had the option not to, we had the option to wait, see, see it through and do it in person anyway, um, and forget about this digital version. Um, so in the fall, uh, Pi Hole got together and we did some mini tests and we decided that this show was a good contender to translate into a digital theater piece. And a couple of the things that made us decide to do that is, one, we there aren't that many characters in, in the show. Um, there aren't that many people who do much talking. It's really mostly one person doing all the talking. And we knew that that um, helped kind of limit some of the variables and the scope of the show. And the other thing that we thought would make it a really good contender is that it was an interactive piece. And one of the real challenges with digital theater is that often, you know, people have multiple tabs on, they're in their homes. It's just so, there's so much to compete with to, to maintain um, audiences' attention with a piece. Um, and so we thought, well, this already lends, is already lightly interactive. We can just sort of see that interactivity through into this digital, and digital, medium and um, really enhance that aspect of it in this form. Um, so originally the show um, that my alter ego Nagus promises to feed everyone Persian food, which she does not. Um, but in the digital version, we decided to translate that and make it an online cooking class where she pr promises to uh, divulge the divine secrets of Persian cuisine, which she does not. Um, and so, uh, there's other another thing we realized when we decided to do this piece and we did some mini testing is that we were going to need to do this partially remotely and have several of the collaborators working on the project be in a shared space together. Um, so we just knew that I and the computing power and um, operators and camera operators all would need to be in a shared space. So we had to sort of navigate how to do that in a COVID friendly way. Um, COVID friendly, COVID safe, let's say. Um, so we're going to get into mostly today the technical side and the design side of this translation of the show to a digital medium, but, um, and you're going to meet the designers who worked on the show, but I want to just shout out to Ryan Gedrick and Violet Tafari, who are our producer and uh, production manager on this project, who not only coordinated all of the technology and procuring everything and all the communication that had to happen to make this piece exist, um, but they also made sure that you know, all of the COVID protocols and PPE and all of that were taken care of so that it could happen safely without any cases of COVID. Um, so that was great um, and we really appreciate them. The other people who are you won't be seeing today are uh, Heidi Davis, who is our champion uh, dramaturg and who uh, very early on was like, oh yeah, definitely do this uh, digital. This is such a good show for that. Um, and uh, Leila Khoshnudi, who was a key collaborator on this for the in-person version, as well as the digital version. Um, and Hassan Nazari Robati, who is an actor who was not on site with us. He was in Colorado. 
So you're gonna be seeing him in some of the clips today, but you won't be hearing from him um, on this panel. Um, and of course, everyone at the public and the AV team who helped us navigate. Um, and they were just such a great sounding board as we were developing the system for this project. Um, so that's really all I'm gonna say. I'm just gonna turn it on over to the designers. Um, and uh, I mentioned that we, uh, had to find a space where we could work. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Pi Home member and uh, production designer, Alexandra Panzer, who's going to tell us about that process of finding a space. Thanks, Tara. Um, hi, everyone. Okay, so as Tara said, our first major sort of creative technical hurdle was um, figuring out where we would do the show after we decided that we would in fact do it. Um, and the two challenges that we faced there were one, um, for this show, we had to be rehearsing and performing in the same space, which for us, is very unusual for probably a lot of theater makers is very unusual. You, you're usually bopping around from rehearsal space to rehearsal space, but there was no like getting the show on its feet and then teching it. Every rehearsal had to be a tech rehearsal because the show only existed with video, Zoom, and uh, audio. So um, we needed to, to solve that problem very quickly. The problem was, not the problem, the fun challenge was that we, um, we had decided to translate the show into, from as Tara mentioned, from this dinner party into this cooking show in order to justify it being on a small screen. And to do, um, but, but we had really only gotten that far. <laughs> so the whole second portion of the show, which is the murder mystery aspect, we really had like no idea how that was going to work, what that would look like. Like truly we, we just, it was a blank at that point. And same with audience participation, which was such an important part of the show. So, so all we had was this image of the cooking show and we bounced around a couple of ideas for spaces. We, we considered doing it at one of our apartments, which thank goodness we didn't do. Um, but we eventually one night, like in a meeting, we all just got on Airbnb and started looking uh, at random listings. And we were looking for this set in our minds of this cooking show space. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, okay, sharing. Oops. Okay. So this, this kind of classic, like, you know, um, kitchen island in front of the presenter kitchen cabinets behind the presenter, sort of very flat, um, perpendicular to the camera angle. And that's basically what we were looking for. And so there were spaces like this and this, which also came with a washer dryer, which we were interested in. Um, then we thought maybe, oh, we could put like a kitchen island in front of this cabinet. And this is really us just like clicking around the map on Airbnb in neighborhoods that were relatively accessible to us. Um, and then we just happened to stumble on this space, which at first we thought like, oh, this doesn't actually work for us, but um, because it's not like the, this image of a cooking show, um, but we, but it had a lot of the components that we get excited about in a theatrical space, specifically like the depth. We love, we, one of our favorite jokes is things being really far away on stage or really close. And so this, this would potentially allow us to play with that. And it had this like mysterious door that could sort of charge the space with this weird energy, like what's behind that door. We could play with the lighting coming through that door. And anyway, um, all this to say, I, I mentioned this because this is a this is a how we did it, not why we did it. Um, but it was really ultimately important that we followed the instinct to um, go with the space that felt most playful to us, that felt most related to the the instincts we use in our the medium our our home medium, so to speak. Um, as opposed to, we, we, were, we were kind of working backwards from this idea of what a cooking show looks like. And instead, it, it felt like a real gamble at the time to go with this space instead. Um, but it was ultimately so important that we went with a space that brought its own kind of character and its own constraints and um, its own sort of playfulness to the table. Cause that's that's how we like to work. That's how we usually like to work. Those are, that's what's, um, important to us. Um, so 
but moving along, wait, so yes, we went with this space. Um, we needed it for about two months. I think rehearsals and uh, shows included maybe a little less. Um, and just so uh, folks know, like uh, if you don't already, there are some good deals on long-term rentals on Airbnb. So um, uh, especially during the pandemic. So that where that might not have been an option before, it's potentially an option now. Um, and, and, and yeah, and once we got there too, like if, if you look around in these other pictures of the space, there's this random thing, like what, what is this? I don't know, but maybe we can use it for something, uh, which ended up being like our lab space. And yeah, it just had sort of like a lot of, it was bringing a lot to the table, um, which was really helpful, especially because we didn't know what we wanted from the, the murder mystery section of the show. So anyway, this became the container. Also this great big open space here where we could maybe set up all the tech, which again, we didn't know what that would be, but we assumed it needed a lot of space. Um, and then uh, the coup de gras, it had a fireplace. So it was really, it was undeniable. Um, but anyway, this was the container we knew we wanted to fill. And um, uh, actually I can show just real quick what, what it looked like here in the kitchen. You can see we got to play with these sort of distances and um, you know, it, it, it just like gave us a lot to, to work with. Um, but anyway, this was the container of the show, but in order to make this into anything, we needed uh, movie magic, basically, uh, and tech magic, and a, and a magic combination of the two, uh, which is where Stefania and Ali come in, who um, did video and, and all this design work for us there that really like made this space come to life. So I'm gonna throw to you guys. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Stefania Olvarela and I was the video designer, projection, video designer and Ali, do you want to present yourself? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm Ali Cronin or Alessandra and I uh, was an assistant to Stefania as well as programmer for uh, Disclaimer. Yeah, so um, let me share with you a video. Uh, this is a video we call the snack moment. And yes, as Alexandra said, it was a whole combination about the space we were at, but then the virtual world and how we showed this, this, uh, this show through Zoom, right? So let me share this first. Do we, oh, do you see it pixelated? Okay. <laughs> Great, so it doesn't have sound so we can talk over it. But uh, mainly we had three cameras in the room, two 1080p Logitechs and one Lumix um, DSLR. And here you can see some of our special effects, which is the smoke. So, <laughs> and the border and the pistachio flying and the snack break. Um, so this is quite, uh, this is a moment where we combined both more of the visual and graphics of this cooking show and include it with the real world, right? Um, in the, um, yeah. So in the performance, we had three cameras, one that we used for the Sheila Kim, that was this specific character. Then we had the DSLR, who, which was static for most of the show and then Alexandra was our operator uh, and towards half of the show this was a camera that was constantly moving um, and then um, the other one was more of the zoom camera at first so every time Tara was addressing the zoom world and talking to the zoom audience that was the camera we would use let me stop share over here and go back to our network a share screen network network here. So this is a little bit of our beautiful um, network map created by Jeff. Um, so to kind of explain to you how we created this, we had the two webcams and the DSLR uh, connected to our main computer. The DSLR was connected through HDMI into a black magic video capture card into through Thunderbolt into our main computer. In our main computer, we had uh, a QLab, 
where we had programmed all the different uh, camera shot camera shots, all the different cameras. We were command through QLab, we would command which camera we would be using, um, as well as all the the like special effects, like all the smoke, all the graphics of the world of the cooking show. Uh, once we went into the murder mystery, the black and white. Um, and there in that same computer, we had the QLab and we had OBS. OBS was our streaming platform. And at the moment we were connecting that computer into another computer, which was, sorry, this main Zoom where we had the, this computer where we had the Zoom. And we sent through virtual OBS camera, through NDI, uh, we connected into our main computer that was Tara on Zoom. Um, and yeah, and then we had a lot of monitors around the room. So when they went into like the murder mystery part and it was the other room in the space in the apartment, uh, there were monitors so they could look at Zoom and respond and interact with the audience live at the moment. Um, Ali, I don't know if I'm missing anything. Do you want to add something? Um, no, I think the only thing, other thing we're missing then uh, as part of like a puzzle piece uh, here is Eli um, then controlling the different aspects of Zoom via Zoom OSC, which we'll get into later. Um, totally, and Zoom OSC was in a separate computer at Eli's house. Right. We decided that we would have that separate to command and spotlight and pin and show the video of different participants' audience during the Zoom. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about our network. Um, and then I don't know, um, Ben, if you want to talk about. Great. Yes, I will talk about the other the other part of this um, this little chart that we're looking at. Um, I'm Ben Vigas. I was the sound designer on this. Um, and yeah, so for so for this version, um, there were a few things that we knew that we wanted to be able to do. We knew that we needed um, Tara to be able to move around the space freely and sound good everywhere, um, sound as good in the cooking show portion as in the murder mystery portion. Um, so we knew that we needed a wireless mic for her, um, we were able to borrow a couple wireless transmitters um, that are normally used on like film. Um, we bought a Countryman B6 was the lav mic that she used. Um, and then we knew that we needed to be able to play fun music cues um, for the murder mystery section and um, you know, little, little things in the cooking show portion also. Um, we also needed to keep the sound system relatively simple because as you can tell from looking at this chart, the video was pretty um, complicated and demanding in terms of like computing power and number of computers and just like equipment. Um, so we kept the sound, we, we joined the sound cue lab with the video cue lab just so that that would live in one place uh, so that we wouldn't need as many computers um, and to just decrease the number of things that could go wrong. Um, and then uh, finally, we needed Tara to be able to hear sound cues um, in order to be able to perform alongside them. Um, so we needed an in-ear monitor so that we could play the music cues um, and make that, especially in the murder mystery section, make that sort of as live and reactive as possible. Um, so in order to do that, um, actually, Stefania, could you, are you still sharing your screen? Yeah, great. I'm gonna share that same thing, but just have my mouse be able to move around. Um, okay, great. So yeah, so the, the real hub of the sound system here was um, this Motu audio interface, which um, Tara's mic was plugged into. Uh, the interface was plugged into the show computer, which was sending sound um, cues to the Motu. Um, and then the Motu was also a mixer. So then the Motu was sending the mixed sound cues and vocals back to the show computer, um, which then united with the video in OBS and then was sent over NDI to the Zoom computer here. So Motu, show computer, Zoom computer. Um, 
the Motu was also sending sound cues um, via this in-ear monitor transmitters to Tara, Alexandra, and Jeff so that they could hear what was going on as they were moving around the space for the murder mystery portion. Um, and then finally, what's not represented in here is that the audio from Zoom itself was also sent to the Motu so that, uh, which was then sent to Tara's in-ear monitor so that she could hear um, conversation in the Zoom room for the final conversation with the uncle at the end. Um, meanwhile, during the show, I was on my computer looking at this. Um, I was looking at, so the, the interface had this digital um, mixing interface. So I, this is Tara's mic, this is the Zoom audio, this is the QLab audio. I was looking at this here, remotely controlling that, muting and unmuting her mic. Um, I was looking at the Q lab up here. It's hidden because I wasn't really doing much with it. I was just making sure nothing went wrong. Um, and then I was watching the show on Zoom, um, listening to make sure everything sounded good. Um, how are we doing I'm on time? Ooh, my screen. There we go. Uh, yeah, we had some troubles with um, loud mic pops and um, uh, radio frequency interference. So we had to, at one point, search around for a better frequency. Um, that was a new thing for me. Um, and uh, eventually, we, we tried to keep me operating remotely for as long as possible. Um, but then ultimately, we sort of realized that the system was too complicated and it made sense to have someone in the space running sound so that they could keep an eye on levels and be there in case you know a cord got unplugged um, as everybody was running around the space and that is about everything as far as the uh sound setup is concerned um so i'm gonna pass it off to reza now to talk about lights hi everyone um so I think Ben mentioned a couple of things that um, applies to lighting as well. One of them was, um, you know, the film quality of this um, production, because I, I had done other Zoom productions before and I ended up um, making a system that I was able to control lights via internet and smart bulbs and all of the things that it was exciting, but it, I think, it would add additional unnecessary layers to, to the complexity of this show that we, I think we didn't want to do it. And the other thing was because um, Tara, the performer was moving around the space a lot. So I, I uh, lighting should have, you know, the ability to, to follow the performer wherever she was going. So I abandoned that idea and we, um, we ended up having um, basically three different lighting vocabulary or instrument um, system. One for the stationary lighting setup for the, the main cooking area that it, I ended up using very cheap but very effective um, lighting um, instrument like the regular bulb and, and um, like paper lantern. That's my favorite type of um, making like a very soft light for actor's face and um and then the other one was um using two different lighting in instruments that they are flexible that you can move them around without you know being worried about like um like uh, destroying the bulb or or the other thing consuming a lot of electricity because that's another uh, problem was we were actually doing this show in an apartment and the apartment doesn't have that much um, uh, capacity to to consume a lot of power, and um, if yeah, I want to just share show you what I used for this pr production here. This is one of our lighting um, instrument. This is we we had two sides of this LED tube that we used. One of them basically wherever. Taro was going, I was following her from the top, from the bottom or different angles. And then the other one was a smaller one. We put it in the, the, the fireplace. And the nice thing about this instrument is that you can actually have a 
uh, have a, a fire effect on it. So it was glowing and flickering like a fire coming through that fireplace. And the other one is, is another typical film, TV, lighting equipment. And they are very tiny spotlight that we could, you know, hang them in a very tight spot or one of them, it was coming from the, from the table that Tara playing around it and we were able to cast a shadow behind her. In general, all of the lighting um, that we use, it was uh, mostly I would say for film and TV production and we having this in mind that we wanted to have the, the mobility feature and color changing and energy efficiency. Um, I think yeah, that's all I have to share about lighting, thank you. Okay, so next up, um, we have Eli and Ali. Um, if you two can talk about Zoom OSC, this like revelation in the process um, that yeah, you guys can tell everybody what that's all about. Yeah. Um, Eli, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Eli Schleicher. I was the stage manager in this process. And inside that little bubble in that uh, graphic you saw earlier, I was the remote tech team, uh, me, <laughs> in my apartment. Uh, so, Al, you want to talk a little bit about this uh, miracle program, Zoom OSC? Yeah. Uh, Zoom OSC, which I will, I will share kind of a screenshot of what it looks like, um, is a software developed um, by Liminal. Um, and it essentially allows us to create uh, cues for spotlighting, pinning, chats, um, all happening within Zoom. Um, for this show, we used QLab. Uh, to program that and I thought I would just share kind of what these programs look like. Um, it uses open sound control, so OSC controls obviously in the name. Um, and we have all sorts of things going on there. Um, but Eli, the lovely stage manager, was the one who was controlling all of this. And at the time, Zoom OSC was still sort of in development. It actually has changed a little bit uh, since we used it for this show. And this has been in you know the last two or three months or so. Um, but at the time there were restrictions, some features that weren't available. So Eli then had to do some hopping around between Zoom OSC and regular Zoom to spotlight, unspotlight, whatever, uh, whatever the queue called for, um, uh, that was not available to do through Zoom OSC. So shout out to Eli for that because it was quite a, uh, a juggle, I would say. Um, Eli, if you want to share what that was like. Yeah, sure. So, um, Ali, if I can share something from my screen as well. Um, Stop share, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, this is uh, a, a real window behind the scenes of what my setup actually looked like. So, I was running two monitors here, and I'll just sort of break down what you're seeing on them. Um, so, over here we have Discord, which was sort of our a uh, comm system um, for this whole process. We were, uh, anyone who was operating something during the show was in our Discord channel, mostly on mute because there were already too many audio things happening. <laughs> uh, so that was always up for me. Then behind that sort of peeking out, you can see a little QLab window, which was sending commands into Zoom OSC as Ali mentioned. Then over here on my laptop, it looks like there's one Zoom window open, but in fact, there are two. Um, so uh, the first Zoom window you're seeing, that is the actual call, the Zoom call that I was on. Um, and it's very tiny, but I was in there as Eli. Um, and then hidden behind that window is the Zoom OSC window, which has a very similar interface to Zoom. Uh, but at the time, as Ali alluded to, um, Zoom OSC uh, didn't quite have all the functionality that it um, that we needed for this show. So essentially, um, I'll stop sharing now. Um, essentially what Zoom OSC could do at the time was spotlight individual people um, and send chats to individual people or the whole um, Zoom call as a group. Um, it can do more than that, but those were the functions that we were particularly interested in. Uh, the things that it couldn't do, um, was Zoom had recently launched its ability to spotlight multiple people at one time. Uh, and Zoom OSC had yet to update for this functionality. And so um, typically what the beginning of the show would look like is I would spotlight one person using Zoom OSC. And then if we wanted to add multiple guests, for instance, there's a moment where 
um, three members of the of a family of doctors are on screen. And so to make that moment happen, I would have to go into the chat, um, find those people that we had selected to participate in that way and spotlight them manually. And so there was this constant interplay between the uh, automated functions and then the uh, manual functions that I was supplementing when Zoom OSC didn't have that functionality. Um, I'm happy to report that Zoom OSC has recently launched an update, um, Zoom OSC 4.0. So this specific function of multiple spotlights um, now exists where you can add people and it sort of, it knows how to understand that information in Zoom. Um, but I, uh, the one other thing I mentioned is that um, to make this spotlighting happen, to automate it, um, it draws information from what everyone is named in the Zoom call. And so this is another sort of uh, manual switch that became a design feature that we had to integrate, um, was uh, naming everyone very specifically so that Zoom OSC could essentially find them quickly in the Zoom call. Um, so this is where we ended up, you know, uh, having to put, uh, change everyone's name to a character name and then also put that character name in quotations. Um, this did two things. One, it alphabetized them to the top of the list so that they were easy to find for manual cues. And two, um, it allowed us um, to have them be a very specific name so that we could pre-program all of our cues rather than having to go find uh, someone named uh, Stefania in the call, we could just find quote mamani and uh, run the cues in that way. Um, so this renaming functionality is still something that is manual um, within Zoom. As far as I know, it's not something that can be automated just yet, but those were the sort of two things that were working in tandem um, to make this Zoom OSC uh, happen. Uh, I think that's just about everything that we did. There's one other like tidbit, which is that um, in fact, we couldn't, uh, because of Zoom OSC's uh, syntax, um, it uses quotation marks to demarcate people's names. And so while it looked like we had put everyone's names in quotation marks, in fact, we put them inside of four apostrophes um, because Zoom OSC uh, knew what that was. Uh, and it got very confused when we put, started people, putting people's names in quotation marks. So um, that is a little window into how we made Zoom OSC run. Um, and how Zoom OSC also, you know, didn't serve quite all of our needs. And so we had to supplement it with this manual um, Zoom function as well. Um, but by now, you know, I've started talking about all these things that were happening. I, like I said, I was uh, far away um, in my own apartment during this, running this all remotely, which is kind of extraordinary in its own right. Um, but there were, you know, you know 13,000 other puzzle pieces happening inside <laughs> the apartment. Um, so I will uh, pass it off now to uh, Alexandra and Reza and Jeff to talk about like what the inside performance looks like. And just, just before you do that, I, I, I just love hearing you talk about Zoom OSC because it is also the other thing about it is that it's just so new and, and Ali was like on the Zoom OSC Slack. So if there was ever any issue or whatever, then Ali would just go on to the Zoom OSC Slack and like ask questions. And there's like a mess, essentially a message board where you can just troubleshoot all of this stuff. So all of those little problem solving things of like, oh, instead of quotation marks, use apostrophes, just like an ongoing uh, discovery that was happening for people using Zoom OSC and the Zoom OSC people who are like the people, the creators of Zoom, Zoom OSC themselves. It's a very like, you know, a lot of communication going around, very scrappy DIY <laughs> um, community. Anyway, sorry, yeah, so that's that covers, I believe, all of our setup um, and gets us a little bit into the operating of the show. Um, and Alexandra, I will, yeah, send it back to you and I interrupted. No, no, I'm so glad you said, I was going to actually ask Tara for them to talk about where, where you guys were going for all these problem solving things. Cause I think that's so interesting too. Um, but okay. So we have our technical setup. We're in our space. Okay. Yes. So one of the, we, 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 sh I showed you guys a, a look at the, um, the cooking show setup, and then in order to uh, create this sort of like heightened, slightly surreal, kind of magical, like how is this live? Is this pre-recorded? 
feeling of the murder mystery part of the show, we wanted to create all these like discrete little sets. And I am going to share my screen again real quick. Um, and so here is like, just a, here's like a handful of these, these little sets that we made. Um, and uh, real quick again, cause this is uh, how we did it. Uh, most of the set dressing here for the tablescapes all came from big reuse, um, some Craigslist thrift shops and junk shops around Brooklyn. Some of it sourced from our own homes and some of the stuff we, we bought new and there's some eBay on here. Also, for anyone who wants to know how to make this like weird chemical reaction that uh, Tara is looking at in the little lab setup, the bottom is just water and food coloring, then um, vegetable oil, and you just pop an Alka-Seltzer in there and it turns into a little lava lamp. It's very fun. Um, uh, and the pool of blood in the lower right is uh, Hershey's syrup classic. Um, but anyway, so we had all these tiny little sets and they're all um, much closer to each other than you might think in watching the show. Um, for example, if we look at the middle image here of Tara kneeling by the fireplace. So the whole table setup that you see in the top uh, row there is just outside the frame uh, on the left of Tara in that uh, center picture. And uh, and so we did, we did a lot of like careful camera work to try and mask things in the space to help give you that feeling of like suddenly being in a new, totally new space and feeling like a little disoriented. Like how did we, how are we now suddenly in a new space? And that took a lot of trial and error of like figuring out how to um, uh, create that illusion. Uh, also, because um, we're going to show you guys a time lapse, but there's there are like monitors hidden around the space that Tara is using for visual cues and that the camera operators and Reza on lights were also using um, for visual cues. So those are often like just outside the frame here. And we obviously had a few mistakes where they actually showed up in the show. But um, and then real quick, this is the the one of the final moments of the show here when we finally see what's behind this door and we see Tara in the bathroom. And um, on the left, you see the floor of the kitchen that we've been, we spent so much of the show in uh, is covered in all this stuff and, and the sort of detritus of the show. And that happened by uh, Reza and Jeff, like hauling ass over there to, to uh, spread out all these props and everything. And then I'm filming the floor in part to mask Reza running into the bathroom to turn on the practical light in the bathroom, which was not automated. Um, and which is all just to say that there's a funny combination of like, uh, like tech, like very sophisticated tech and very um, practical, uh, um, tech and uh the i think the combination is where a lot of that fun texture comes from i want to share my screen one more time here to show you guys this time lapse and um let me turn off the sound okay and uh yeah reza and jeff if you want to uh weigh in a little bit about how how this all worked yeah so on your left is us in the space um that's uh, Alexandra operating the main camera, me operating the webcam on a tripod, um, and that's Reza with the lightsaber light. Um, moving around in this tiny little dining room space, making those different little little jewel box um, scenes happen, um, kind of scrambling into just these little compositions and then moving. Um, and, you know, uh, Right, like I might have to scramble away to go clean something up or go make a new mess somewhere to set it up for the next scene while they kept filming. Um, and Reza's turning on and off lights. You can see it go dark and then get bright again. And yeah, we were just mm -hmm. sort of scrambling around this, this little apartment. It's like a sports commentary. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think the first thing after um, we had the, the skeleton of the piece, I think when I joined the, the rehearsal before actually starting, like we were teching, but actually starting teching and putting together everything, 
when I joined um, like in the movement, I was trying to find how to light the piece. Um, I asked for a very specific cable choreography because it was everything was connected, um, you know, with cables and a lot of uh, wires around the space, especially with the cameras. So I really needed that to find my path and how to move without tripping to the cameras or or destroying the entire system. So that took us a while to to figure out like what is my movement when I'm like where I'm putting my step all of the thing and um the other thing was as you see in the left video in the time lapse video is just changing the light as we are going into different different location and honestly I think part of me I could just let the light be on on the um the, the cooking area for for a while but I feel like even as like I'm coming from theatrical background and I feel like that lighting shift is helping us not only to tell the story, but to actor, to be in the mood of the, you know, the show as we are moving forward. And the, the moment that it goes dark is the moment that Tara is actually is in the, in the uh, bathroom. So we didn't want to have anything in the space when she, camera is tracking back and Tara is coming back to, to her kitchen island. So I think it's all about just figuring out that the timing, the timing was the most important thing for me um, as I was uh, like lighting the live show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, like Reza said, there was so many um, uh, things getting knocked over, um, <laughs> you know, choreographing moments and then realizing they completely don't work because of something else coming up, re-choreographing, um, and just until we kind of tweaked it until everything was just making allowance for, for everything else to happen. And, and it, we achieved a kind of a balance and it became a kind of a dance um, after a while, um, lots of trial and error. Um, and then I just wanna jump in on sound just very quickly. It also, even when it became its most elegant dance, it still was sometimes very loud uh, with just cable cables being dragged across the floor and footsteps on a creaky green point floor. Um, so been. for some moments there were like some, some strategic muting and unmuting of, of Tara's mic to try and mask that as much as possible. And one That's thing- right. Yeah, so part of the one thing. Too. One more thing I, I learned from those moments that it was in black and white, you know, because the contrast was higher than the, you know, I had something in mind for lighting. And I, when I was looking at, look at the monitor, I realized, that, oh, this is just in black and white. So I don't need to be, or I need to do this. You know, it's just something that we learned in tech as we were moving forward, how to differentiate the lighting quality for black and white section and the regular color section. Mm -hmm. Totally. All right, um, so that is, oh, I just love this. I love, I love seeing Reza running around with his lightsaber. <laughs> it's my favorite. Um, uh, and it really just felt so crazy, like such a crazy secret that this was, that there were four bodies flying around this room and the audience was mostly really only seeing just one, one little window into that. Um, so this was a secret we were very happy excited to share. Yes. Um, I am now going to turn it over to Jeff who's sitting right next to me to talk about another little magic secret revealed, which is the the second time Piehole has used a live printer in a show. Uh, not the first, but still. That's true. Uh, he'll talk to, to us about um, the live printout moment. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm going to kind of introduce both moments that, uh, or both both of the main ways that we used um, images of audience members um, who, were, who were live attendees who were brought into the, the show. Um, um, first I'll say, I, I, my role on this was that I was uh, the co-director with Tara. Um, and you'd think that would mean that I was sitting back and watching the Zoom uh, the whole time and you know, trying to craft it with, you know, from a uh, objective span point. But no, in our, um, you know, in our skeleton crew of, of kind of COVID safe, as small of numbers as we could get it in the space, um, I became a very important member of the of the run crew. So I, I um, so whenever there was something that needed to be done for some ambitious magic trick that we were trying to accomplish, um, I was the kind of person who was left over um, to do that. Um, so 
I was also helping um, Eli um, cast audience members in the very beginning of the show as they entered the Zoom, um, which is, I think, a, a fun thing to reveal that that was happening. And one thing I forgot to say about that is that the audience was anywhere between like 70 to like 150 people in the Zoom room with us. And so we then, there are 10 characters that we cast audience members as, and we reveal that at different points through the show. So, so what Jeff is referring to is that in the pre-show, Eli and Jeff are secretly casting people. Mm -hmm. They don't know it yet. They won't know till we get to that moment in the show, but they get started on that early. Sorry. Go right, ahead. right. And that's based on discussions that we had as a creative team about what, you know, uh, strategies for casting people. And the cast would be very different from night to night, but we would kind of have some, some strategies going into it. Um, and then my, um, my next job after that was that I would be at, at select moments when Tara would instruct the audience members to strike certain poses or do certain things, that would be my moment to take a screenshot of them, um, which would be employed in various ways later. And um, I'll, I'll kind of show one of the, uh, one of the first, so let me bring up this clip and I'm gonna show, um, and this one has sound, so we'll just, stop and um, watch slash listen to this moment. In the hall, Sheila reveals to me that she has reason to believe that Dr. Dusty, who's newly a widow, was having secret dealings with the nuclear program in Iran. And she also suspects her own brother-in-law, Farhad, was taking part in it somehow. Sheila suspects Dr. Sohrabi and Mamani had caught wind of this and were going to turn them in and therefore had to die. But as Sheila is telling me all of this. Okay, there you go. Um, so in, in that moment, the, um, the audience is uh, astonished to see um, some, some of their own faces um, have been um, printed out and affixed to a suspect slash victim board um, on a piece of paper in the house of one of the performers who is unbeknownst to them is in Colorado. Um, not that that matters, but- um, It matters to us. It matters to us that it, that it was in Colorado. So um, in order to make that happen, um, basically I was taking these screenshots and I was sort of cropping them so that they would all fit ne well next to each other on one page of a, um, I believe it was a Word document that I used, um, and and in the right order, so that um, in a in a one spare moment, um, Hassan, who was extremely busy over there doing toy theater with cookies and other things, um, so that he could run to his printer. So I would actually drop the file. I would make it into a PDF, drop it into the chat in Zoom, and um, in a private message to Hassan, he would tell me like, "Got it." And then he would download it, print it out, do like, I think he had it down to like, you know, like four cuts of a scissor <laughs> and, and he would like stick it onto his, onto his map. Um, so, so that's, that's how we created that moment. Very, very, very janky, very analog, um, but still magical in the context of Zoom. So um, um, I will, um, Next, I'll share um, a moment that used audience images, but in a, in a little more of a high tech way and in a way that actually brought together kind of all the technology um, that we were using in a pretty um, um, kind of holistic way. This is another thing I forgot to say earlier that I think will also be helpful to keep in mind for this, which is that all the design stuff you saw that Stefania showed where it was an image of me during the snack time and it was the border and the smoke and all of these visual effects, the black and white, those all happened on my Zoom square. Because with the setup where we're in Zoom and our audience is in Zoom, the it's we haven't found a way, I don't think it's possible to control the visual landscape of everybody's individual Zoom squares. When you see shows that do that, they're often capturing from Zoom and streaming elsewhere. And that gives you more total control over various Zoom squares. But because we were committed to having the audience be in Zoom with us, we only had that control over my individual Zoom square. 
So then we had this conundrum where we had these audience participants and we wanted to figure out how can we integrate in some way, integrate the audience participants into our design. So one way is the printouts that, that Jeff just showed us. And the other way is this is in the second clip. Okay. This is another, this is one example of, um, of a way that we did this. Um, we, there were several moments like this, but this sort of um, incorporates the most elements all at once, I would say. Each of us imprisoned by our labels, we sought to break out. That's an audience. We knew by turning to drugs an intercontinental drug manufacturing and trading ring. And I, by volunteering at an animal shelter on weekends and offering free SAT prep to low-income households. So before you judge Minu too harshly, ask yourselves this. What role did her community play in her actions? Minu and I shared many things, our secrets, our isolation. Like the unusual occurrence of inosculation, the process by which two trees grow together with their respective roots forming a shared foundation for their union, Minu and I have become one. Okay, so there's a lot going on there um, during this, this uh, double death um, monologue. Um, and so let's just turn it over to Ali so Ali can talk a little bit about, oh, you have your well, side of that first. Yeah, so, so, so it, it will go over to Ali in one second. Um, <laughs> But uh, so the first, the first thing that had to happen was um, that I had to get screenshots of those audience members holding their object in that certain pose that Tara um, tricked them into doing. Um, and uh, we, one thing we ran into was you saw that their images were a certain dimensions because they were, they were like, they had a frame, this like ragged paper frame around them. So they always had to be the exact same dimensions and actually the exact same like pixels wide and high. Um, so the way we solved this was in an unexpectedly, once again, janky way. And this was uh, actually Ali's ingenious idea was that I, um, I actually put tape on my computer screen um, around the Zoom window and on the other screen that I was using so that every time I cropped those images, um, it would be exactly the same um, dimensions, you know, maybe one or two pixels off. And then when it later appeared, which Ali will tell you about, it would correctly fit all the different mats. And there was even some images that in a different clip that were ovals because they had to fit into these oval picture frames. So I used like an oval mat that I had kind of mapped out with just tape on the screen of my computer. Um, so I would take those images, I would give them a file name of the character and I would drop them into a Dropbox, a shared Dropbox that Allie was also in um, on the AV computer. So Allie, do you want to take, take it away? Yeah, um, I think with many of the things that we've described tonight, similarly, this was a dance <laughs> to achieve uh, getting these images into the um, QLab file. Um, Jeff would send them in the Dropbox and usually because I was running all of the camera cues, video and sound cues as well from this QLab, I had somewhere between like 10 to 30 seconds to drag and drop the correct file into the correct queue um, in order to achieve uh, these sequences. Um, but I think it paid off <laughs> because uh, it's just awesome. It just looks so good. I'm sitting here so nostalgic of this time and like baffled by the amount of work that went into this and how insanely inventive all of this was. Um, but yeah, I mean, the screenshots moments were probably the most that my heart has raced uh, <laughs> in the last. I'm pretty docile sitting at home and me sitting there trying to get everything in the right place um, for these shows was, was really intense. Um, but again, big payoff uh, and a, a lot of teamwork into making that happen. So as the person sitting next to you on the couch, it was very gratifying uh, when we would get to the end of one of these moments and I would hear you like sigh relief that it had <laughs> been pulled off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. And um Another aspect of that moment that you'll notice was the was the kind of like live animation um, and graphics. And Stefania, do you want to say just a little something about that other added element? 
Sure. Um, yes. At the beginning was like, we need to put like, in order to create, to make this pictures part of the world we were portraying, it was like, we need to put some frames. And there was like, almost, I think it was like kind of one of the last days I'm like, let's take them. It'll be easy. We can drop any images. And Ali was like, no, let's practice one more time. We'll get it. And I'm like, okay, we'll practice. And eventually after doing it a few times, it was like, let's keep the frames. Yeah, totally. So yeah, that's about it. <laughs> well, thank you all. I feel like for me, I think the printer thing was the thing I would got the most surprise, surprise reacts from so um, and questions about so I'm glad that we saved that one for the for last. Um, so uh, we're gonna, uh, there's some questions in the chat bar, which I will read out and so um, when I say chat bar, I mean, at the bottom. So where this live stream is happening, if you scroll down, there's a chat section, and that's where you can um, put in your questions. Um, so um, we have a question here. Uh, well, there's a two-parter. What did you discover from having an audience? And somebody else wrote, I was wondering the same thing. Did you ever have an audience member who didn't want to participate? Um, so I think that there's, so I'm just gonna address the didn't wanna participate part of that question. Um, and then maybe there's other things that we've discovered from having an audience um, that people can jump in about. So just as far as the audience participation goes, whether you're doing it live in person or online, it's always this question of navigating consent. And um, you know, you always, I, I'm sure we've all had this experience where you see someone chosen for an audience participation moment and they look like they just want to die and it makes you feel so bad for them and it's a horrible feeling, which is 100% a thing we want to avoid. Um, and, uh, or the opposite where, you know, there's so many ways in which audience participation can go awry. And in the live in-person version, we made a kind of a joke about that, like, oh, calling this minimally invasive participation. I want to see how little I can get you to participate. I don't want to, I don't want you to have to say things out loud. I really don't want to touch you. Like this is not what this is. And then gradually bringing people out as we gain their trust little by little. And we had to navigate that differently digitally. Um, the circumstances were totally different. So for one thing, on the one hand, it's less risky because, you know, an audience member could just turn off their cameras and say like, bye, like I'm not here or they can just leave the Zoom room. You can't as easily just leave a theater space. Um, but on the, on the other hand, they're also more vulnerable in a way because you not only see them, but you also see their space and they're not just one in a crowd as they are in a theater. They're, they're spotlit and so they're big. And so, you, you know, there's a close up of them. Um, and so we, um, we dealt with this in a couple of different ways. Sometimes we had, um, you know, people would turn off their cameras. So that was an easy way to just say, all right, we'll recast. Sometimes we had audience members whose internet crapped out or some, they had some technical issues. So we would just deal with that by me vamping and Eli furiously finding someone else to replace them with, which means finding a person, renaming them so that the, our cues can read that person and, and still work. Um, Which I would, Eli got incredibly lightning fast, like <laughs> unbelievably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Prodigy. And, uh, invariably my vamping would just be like, oh no, I thought you were my uncle, but you're not, or like something like that. Um, and I, I don't think, I can't think of any examples where anybody was eventually, where they were selected and, and was, were not, um, did not like consent to it. I think if there was ever, if I'm, if anyone else remembers any of those circumstances. There was one yeah. guy who like shook his head immediately when you selected him and you immediately picked up on it and we're like, oh, no, that's not him. Yeah. Oh, right, but, right, right, right. But we suspected it might be actually because he knew he had like really unstable internet. He hadn't updated his Zoom. We needed our audience members to have updated Zoom so that they could see multiple spot spotlighting. Um, and that was something I had to repeat several times in the pre-show mm -hmm. that they had to update their Zoom, be on a computer, not an iPhone, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, I, I would I would say that the show tried to allow for people to participate in their own way so that you could you could be you could have just tons of fun just to have a party by yourself participating in this show. Um, 
uh, or you could you could keep it kind of like minimal, just follow the instructions and pick up on um, just what you needed to do. And that was a that was a completely legitimate and, um, way of participating. And it was actually nice to have a mix of audience members who were who were over participating and under participating and so anywhere in the middle. It was really nice to have that mix because it it kind of gave a sense of different you know personas, different personalities who were at this at this gathering. Um, this is another thing that I forgot to mention is that in the in-person version, we the silent assistant character who was Ali at the time would quietly give audience members instructions or guide them here or there. In this digital version, we had Hassan um, going into breakout rooms with some of our selected participants and quickly giving them instructions in a breakout room that Eli would put them in. Um, and he would tell them things and and then everybody would get sent back in. And so that's how at certain moments like Nilufar knew to put a knife in her chest or not in her chest, but to make it look like there was a knife in her chest, um, et cetera. There were just a few more complicated things that we would have them do that nobody ever heard me say to do. Um, and so it just added another level of like um surprise and sort of magic up, to up it. the ante on what you expected from the participation based on what you'd seen so far um does anybody else have any other moments of discovery with an audience um that maybe aren't that doesn't need to be related to audience participation necessarily one little thing uh real quick that um you know when this show is about many things ultimately it's about preventing war with iran but it's also about being far away from your family and which was something we wanted to tap into or which was zoom allowed us to tap into in a way that was very specific to the time the being in the pandemic and everyone spending so much time on zoom and so uh we had initially we had this idea that it it was best when we we there are parts in the show where we spotlight audience members who aren't characters in the show, but just like kind of uh, like rotate through some audience members and we see them in their homes and it kind of get, gives you this sense of like people being spread out all over the world and alone, you know. Um, and we had this idea initially that it was better to spotlight people, individuals in their, in their little Zoom squares. But then we saw a couple of times that when, when you saw a family sitting together in their Zoom square, in their home, like in their whole own little world, it, it added a whole nother layer to this, the feeling of like, of people being to the to themes and ideas around family, around separation and all this stuff. So that, that was just like a thing I don't think we could have predicted. We didn't notice it until we started spotlighting some groups and then we we're like oh whoa this is like a whole other kind of layer that was fun and that was that was like a fun discovery before we close because i know we're a couple minutes over seven o'clock i also just wanted to say like um oh i love this question That's though question. oh i was just gonna say that we had a technical difficulties card that we created in case we had any technical issues which we ended up not needing once we once we had our opening night. Um, but we did have a day in tech where we lost, like our power went out. And so what did we get? What was that thing called? UPS battery backup. Okay, we got a UPS. I don't know what that is. Which we backup usually power. do in theater to protect our lighting console and other stuff in case of, you know, losing power. But we didn't expect until it happened for us. So our plan was that if we lost power, which we'd know because some things would go out, but not the important things, we would, you know, we would have just so long for the UPS to power our stuff to run downstairs, you know, um, flip, flip the breaker, and then get back and up and running. Um, so that was something we, we actually thought was going to happen because it had happened. <laughs> I, I just want to include this question because I think it's so funny. Uh, there's a question that's in retrospect what elements did not feel worth the effort they took to make happen does anybody have any answers to that <laughs> gotta ask the audience i guess <laughs> did not feel worth it i i assume that means like did not feel like oh we actually didn't need to do something that, we didn't need to do that in that complicated way we could have done that more simply mm. wow I have a dumb a dumb one. 
which is just the little cutaway where you see the bagel bites lying in a pool of blood. The pool of blood is on top of a pile of rice, <laughs> which you can't really see in the video, but which did take hours to clean out of the, the spaces between the floorboards. So that'll be one for me. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that the reason like the setup got like the setup i think went down a couple of different paths that were like some of them were even more complicated so in some ways i feel like it was complicated to just figure out a system that can allow everything that needed to talk to each other to talk to each other um to mm -hmm. talk about a moment that was complicated that we ended up cutting um originally <laughs> we thought that there would need to be several uh, additional Zoom operators on hand to help with the spotlighting in a way that was fast and efficient. Um, like eventually we were able to get it so that the rhythm between how fast my fingers could click and the, the rhythm that Tara was speaking at matched up enough that we were satisfied with it. But there was a good week, I think, of rehearsal where we were saying, where Ali would step in and we would sort of alternate spotlighting people to try and get this rhythm um, between the different uh, windows that we were trying to see into people's houses. Um, but that was a, uh, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, great, great, gracefully something that we got rid of. <laughs> Right, and and on the Zoom OSC front, it sounds like the updates in Zoom OSC would would at least create certain simplifications of um, Eli's work and Ali's work um, in terms of making a lot of those cues happen. Mm -hmm. So, on the point of technical difficulties, I will remind us all that my internet did go out one day during a performance um, in which we were not yet fully, or no, we did have our technical difficulties card ready to go, but just sort of emphasizing how much this was a dance, not just between the people in the apartment, but all of the different collaborators connected digitally that um, everything was fine in the apartment. Truly everything was working fine, but the fact that um, this Zoom OSC component was no longer present um, meant that we had to stop the show because all of these things work so delicately in tandem with each other. Mm -hmm. And just one more, one more element that was going on um, that I just want to kind of throw out there was that this was a cooking show um, or it was framed as a cooking show. So there were, there were a certain number of audience members who were cooking along with the show. Um, we had sent out ingredients beforehand and we really did set them up to be able to cook this dish um, uh, eventually, but <laughs> but uh, the cooking show itself didn't didn't bear out. So I, you know that was a little bit of a wild card, I would say, as to how um, and we we sent people the recipe at the end of the show so that they would be able to finish it. Um, but we you know um, I think people reacted in very different ways to how seriously they took the promise that this class would take them through the whole recipe um, and how you know how they reacted to that kind of bait and switch or that kind of framing that turned into something else so that was another little bit of a wild card and of course there were a lot of people who weren't cooking at home they were just like I get it this is a theater show framed as a cooking show um, but both were completely again legitimate ways of participating as an audience member and um, it just added to the kind of experimental nature of it all. Yeah, and at the end of the show, we send them a link to the recipe and a recording of my mother giving me the recipe or like saying how it how it's done. And so um, I think some people did not make it and were very disappointed that they didn't come out of the show with food. And then other people, like I got a bunch of um, either texts or there were a lot of like Instagrams of people like, Put, showing their sabzi polo the result and every time I was like good job good job and I showed my mom she's like this is not the right color um but anyway it was really cool to see how so many people actually did make it which I did not expect um but of course there were definitely people I I assume who were like oh I I, I wish I I wish the show resulted in dinner you know and which it, it didn't it wasn't like show's over now you have a meal it wasn't right. that kind of experience right but we made sure to give them the ability to make dinner out of it, even if it was maybe a slightly later than they expected. So. All right, well, we are now 10 minutes past our time. So I think we will wrap this up, but um, thank you to everybody. This 
for tuning in and for asking questions. And thanks to our wonderful design team here um, for going into detail about exactly how we made this. Um, and of course, this is going to be up on HowlRound. Um, if you want to revisit, look at that little map and pause or screenshot it or whatever, it's there for you. Yeah. Um, and uh, and just so you know, if you haven't seen Disclaimer, we're making it available, the recording of it available on YouTube um, until April 5th. And the link for that is on this HowlRound page. Um, and uh, thank you so thank much you to, HowlRound to HowlRound for HowlRound. making this possible. So thank you so much, HowlRound, for hosting this event and for hosting all kinds of events like this um, that are free and accessible to the community. Um, we think it's awesome. And thank you to Emily Sof for producing this event um, for Pi-hole. Yeah, and if you if you have more questions or if you're like, okay, I just wanna know way more about how the AV setup worked, you can email Pi-hole, I guess, um, pihold at gmail.com, P I-E-H-O-L-E-D, like a past tense verb, at email.com, and we'll pass it along to the appropriate designer, try to answer your questions as best we can. Um, yeah, we want to help. <laughs> yep, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Good rest of your evening or afternoon. Bye. Bye, everyone.